And then when I come back, I'll start it. See how that works? It's it's complicated. It's it's crazy math stuff. Starting, stopping. Just take my word for it. I'm really good at math. Okay, so back to what I was doing. Now, one thing you'll notice is that when I'm doing uh, the this maquette thing, um, whenever you start any sculpture, as a general rule of thumb, stay away from the tools. Just put the tools down. All right. The biggest noob mistake that all sculptors make when they're starting out is that they want to get in and start doing all this tiny little detail. Oh, I'm going to make this detail. It's going to be so awesome. Look at this tiny little nose and his eyes. And, and then they're five times too small or they're in the completely the wrong place. Okay. You've got to nail your form first. You've got to get the volume figured out, the posing, the balance, like that is so key. So that's uh, uh, pro tip number 15. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna keep going on this one. So one thing that's really important when you're sculpting anything, even if it's your own creation, always have some kind of reference at hand. I don't care if you're making a mix between a lizard and a lion and a tin can, you get pictures of those things. Okay, I cannot stress this enough. Pro tip number 16, always have reference. So one thing that I'm doing is I'm continually checking my um, whatever this thing is, like thumb, thumbnail? What was I calling it? A maquette. I'm checking this maquette against the uh, the size thing here that I got off Mr. Internoodle. And it um, helps me to just continually push towards a target. Um, it's way too easy if you, do, if you don't have reference with you to just kind of let it sit at this uh, awkward, mushy, incomplete point where it seems fine to you, but if you actually look at, you know, something that, that um, should hopefully be inspiring you, uh, you would see, oh wow, it still has a lot more work, to, you know, a, a ways to go. So, super important. Now one thing that um, is an issue here is that the actual model, trying to find some good reference for it. Here's a good one. Where the arm attaches to the shoulder, it's um, pushed way out from the body in a very unrealistic way. I, I think this was just to make the, uh, the rig work for the game character. So I'm gonna take a little bit of um, latitude and make it a little more anatomically correct um, pushing in some of the muscles that that you know normally would attach especially an arm that large would need a lot of supporting structure coming off of the shoulder and back so I'm going to be building that up a little more so please forgive me purists you know being a uh, game artist myself. I work on a, uh, a game called Guild Wars 2. I'm an environment artist, but I, I do some sculpting too. I make some statues and rocks. And... This is a city that I worked on. I made that lion statue there. 
as a game artist, I'm continually frustrated by the technological limitations that we're always running into that, um, you know, people who don't make games, uh, a lot of times they think that it's because uh, game designers haven't thought of the ideas like, oh, why don't you make people that talk realistically or, you know, why don't you make it so you can go inside every single building in the game? You know, these kind of things that have, you know, obviously we would love to do that if we could. Uh, there's just things that we can't do for innumerable reasons right now. Um, and so when I see something, uh, when I'm doing a, a, a sculpt of a game character or whatever, it's pretty easy for me to pick out the stuff that's that's there by design and the stuff that's there by necessity. And I have no problem ignoring the stuff that is there by necessity, where I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, if the artist had their choice and didn't have to make it so it animated to a rig and all this kind of stuff, um, uh, you know, it, it would be it would be different, and so I kind of sculpt according to um, the the vision that I'm pretty sure the artist had, as opposed to the actual game asset. So right now he's kind of looking like uh, a blimpy dude. That's all right for now. Just blocking in proportions. Not worried at all about details at all. Now at this point I'm willing to take a small exception to my no tool rule and this is simply because uh, there's points where it's bothering me where it's actually falling apart at the seams you can see there um, and so I'll just take very broad squishy strokes just to just to patch up those seams so it stops falling apart of my hands. Oh, but that's all I'm using it for. That is all. Now I'm going to be kind of putting him in a, uh, a T-pose, uh, sort of, uh, because at this point I'm still deciding what shape or, or what uh, pose he's going to be in. And so I want to keep it as uh, open to a variety of, of poses as possible at this point. So right now it looks like the legs are a little too short and stumpy. And the shoulders are not broad enough. So uh, just gonna keep tweaking. Show you something real quick. Hold on. This is my reference sculpture, and uh, it's very expensive. Don't touch it. Let me take off this special reference folder hat. Ugh. Reference sculpture hat. Okay. So he's got these macaroni joint. Um, on his, his shoulders, probably to allow the the um, skinning on the model to um, do all the various poses that a giant beast that you could climb on has to do. So if we look at um, a real shoulder, and this is going to apply to monsters and aliens and anything else you make. If you want to throw all the rules out the window when you're sculpting and say, oh, it's alien anatomy or whatever, that's fine, it's still going to look like crap. So you want to reference real stuff. So in this case, does this come off? It does. Okay. So these shoulder muscles here that go, uh, they tuck up under the 
shoulder muscle and I'm not going to use any muscle names because that just sounds pretentious and silly and what's the point when you could just point at it and say that one okay so the uh, the chest muscles they they go up and tuck up under the shoulder muscle and that's kind of lacking on this sculpture and uh, in the back these uh, the ones that come from the shoulder blade they go up and tuck up under so when you you lift your arm you're pulling up all those muscles too and pulling up all these muscles and so that's what I'm going to be adding to this guy So you can see here, I'm laying these strips along here, following the, the contour that the, the chest muscles would actually go up into the shoulders. By the way, I was lying about the pretentious thing with muscle names. It's honestly that I just don't know them. I tried memorizing them once. And I gave up and said, what's the point? I can just look at the model and see them. You know, it's like, it's like memorizing your kids' names. There's, there's no point. You just look at the name tag that you put on them. Again, not worried at all about detail. Please, I, you know, I cannot say that enough times. I can, but if I did, I would run out of batteries. I do have three cameras going. That's a lot of batteries. I hope you appreciate this. This is a lot of, a lot of batteries going into this. Now see, I've made a mistake uh, by putting the beard here, um, I'm blocking out where I should be building muscle. So, being the disciplined artist that I am, I'm willing to just go Bleh! And why am I willing to go Bleh! It's easy, because I've hardly spent any time on this. I've kept it rough. I haven't detailed. I didn't go in and make all the little fiddly bits on the beard and every beard hair. I'm just like, whoop, gone. Who cares? I don't care. Do you care? I don't know. You don't care. Speaking of wiping stuff out and starting over again, I'm looking at the picture and I'm seeing, gosh, his head is way smaller than I have it here. This is uh, almost a human or a proportion head. And that thing is probably half that size. So now I could just rip the whole thing off. Um, I'm gonna try to salvage a little bit of it just by crushing it down, pulling it out, I'll pop these horns off. See, I, I made a mistake of going in, a total noob mistake of going in and d detailing, you know, to, you know, level two, uh, detailing the, the face before I had the shoulders and neck and chest put in. So I was not really, um, do, do I need to even finish the sentence? I, I don't think I do. Now, big hulky bulky creatures like the Incredible Hulky Bulk have um, these uh, neck muscles here that go up from the the shoulder into the neck and into the back. Those are always just huge, um, especially when they're hunched over like this guy. So uh, that's definitely going to be a prominent uh, feature. So I'll just add some more bulk there. You ever wonder why the Incredible Hulky Bulk uh, movies that they've made over the past 
10 years or so have been really bad. They got good actors for him. I mean, Edward Norton, he's amazing. Um, that that one they made in 2000 or something. Um, can't even remember that guy's name. Was it Eric Bana? Or was it? I don't know. It's bad luck making the Hulky Bulk. Um, I guess they just need to bring Fr uh, Lou Ferrigno back. Kind of... Uh, I think he just set a precedent that no other actor could rival. So you know how guys um, who have who have big beards and then they they shave the beards they always uh, you know when you first see them after that they kind of look like naked mole rats it's just really disturbing um, and so their their proportions are all just all wrong and there's just gross skin dangling everywhere that's that's kind of the state where I'm at now with the sculpture is you know I, I look at the picture of it and so, so much of his uh, profile is defined by his big barba beard and uh, without it on there it, it looks kind of odd um, so I'm, I'm just kind of having to grip my teeth and get through it and uh, make the best guesses I can about the anatomy that's going on underneath it now this uh, area on the back it's almost a it's almost a diamond shape that's a uh, significant um, gameplay area. It's it's strange to talk about um, gameplay spaces on creatures in video games, but um, that is the nature of this game. Uh, something that makes it incredibly unique and fascinating is uh, that the terrain you're navigating is a living creature. And um, one of the big mechanics is that you have a grip meter, and the longer you're, you know, you're grabbing onto something, uh, the the more it goes down, and so you need to find flat spots on the on the creatures to rest and refill that meter, and so on. Barba here, it's it's this area around here. And remembering that. Uh, tells me that, you know, this guy is very, very stooped over, very hunched. Um, and so I got to make sure that I build up the muscle structure in a way that realistically uh, conveys that. So I'm going to use my tool to draw in a, uh, a general line for where the clavicle would be. This is the that bone that makes the bumps at the base of your neck, but since he's all hunched over and stuff, you don't see much of a neck. Um, you're just going to kind of see these general depressions. See if we can block in this face a little uh, more accurately now.
Okay, I'm uh, breaking my rule again a little bit to show you another one of my cool tools. And it is not this, though it does say cool gear. And as far as gear goes, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's got a thing to hold so your fingers don't get too cold. You can even afford to hold your pinky out when you hold it because the grip is so good. It's this rubbery stuff. You can't dishwasher it though. So, two out of five stars. But here's the other tool. This is called a uh, color shaper. Um, and it's clearly British because it's spelled color with a U. Um, so, I, I, uh, you have to, again, hold the pinky out um, as any good uh, uh, British citizen would do. So, what this is basically is um, a substitute for a, a finger that's smaller than your finger. Hopefully it's smaller than your finger. If you have a finger this small, you are an infant and you should not be sculpting. You will probably eat the clay and you'll choke on it and die. So what this does is uh, let's see, you get kind of soft, uh, mushy um, smoothing, right? Now, this guy is fine for pushing stuff around, but when you want to do really, um, you want to blend two pieces, you kind of get this, this hard thing there. Whereas if you use this, it's got some give to it. Because it's basically just a, a rubber tipped thing. And uh, it's good for roll with it too. And this had bits of gunk on it, so now there's gunk in my sculpture, but that's okay. That's why you don't use cheap, shoddy paintbrushes. So what I'm basically doing here is just uh, helping to keep my, my sculpture somewhat symmetrical by drawing lines uh, across it from time to time. It helps if you uh, start getting blobby to do some graphic uh, lines over it and it really starts to stick out where things are off base. So I need more muscle going from the shoulder blade up to the shoulder. And speaking of shoulder blades, this guy has some pretty Massive ones that I believe actually stick out of his back. Let me see if I can find that. Yeah, ah, there we go. Yeah, so looks like the uh, what is uh, this bone essentially? Let's see. It's not quite at the uh, angle that a human uh, shoulder blade would be. Like considering how hunch this guy is, I'll I'll give them some latitude. Uh, as long as it makes sense that there are muscles attached to it, moving it around, that's what that's what sells the anatomy of a creature and makes it feel right, grounded in reality. Now I've kind of ended up um, 
pushing the top so large that the legs, which I started on, are just way too puny. Uh, so I would either have to scale all the top stuff down or easier just to make the legs bigger. Okay, so I'm basically happy with um, this guy in the state that he's at to accomplish the goal that I need, which is basically a thumbnail sketch to figure out how I want to pose him. So, um, this is the part where basically you just play with it and let me rephrase that. This is the part where you play with the sculpture to try to get a pose that is appealing to you. So, one of the things that popped into my mind, and this is probably a bad idea, but I, I don't know, um, is to have um, the Colossus actually mirroring the, uh, the pose that Wander is in where he, he's about to stab him. Um, that's kind of one of the themes of the game. Uh, I don't want to give too much of a spoiler, but the game is about six or seven years old at this point. Um, as as Wander slays these colossi, he's discovering that um, he's really the monster. And uh, so so kind of um, it, it's a it's a progressive revelation that happens as he becomes more and more corrupted every time he slays one of these things. Their spirit kind of goes into him, and he gets more uh, corrupted and gnarly. And so I thought it might be interesting if you know if because Wander is down on one knee and he's got the the sword up, and so if the Colossus was kind of doing the same thing where it's he's. The Colossus doesn't have a sword, but he's trying to knock Wander off of his head. Um, again, it's not canon. This is not what the Colossus does in the game. Um, but I thought that might be an interesting way to kind of capture that element of the game. Um, it might also just look stupid, like I've made a mistake or I'm not creative. I don't know. So that's the first thing I'm going to try. So I'm going to put Colossus down on one knee.
And you, you probably can't tell, but you know, I kind of blocked in Wander how he's how he's down on his crouching, lifting up his sword arm. So if the Colossus is kind of twisted in the same way. I don't know if I would actually want his hand touching the ground. But experiment with that first. Now you might be able to tell I'm really just wrecking this guy by doing that. That is why you don't want to spend a ton of time on these guys. No, honestly, I made this guy too big. I spent too much time on him and uh, kind of regretting that right now. But um, figured it would it would kind of help with the uh, to be able to see what's going on for the cameras. Um, in general, the more uh, twisting movement that you put in your figures, the more dynamic and interesting they are. It also makes them challenging because you have to figure out how all the muscles uh, would do those kind of poses. So I'm kind of liking that. The, um, get up flat. So we can kind of see different angles here. Uh, it's definitely an interesting pose. Um, it's Here's what it has going for it as far as I can tell. It's got stability so it's going to be easier to build um, if a sculpture has three points of contact with the ground. You don't have to worry as much about balancing it and uh, making the the, um, the armature super strong and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's one advantage. Um, another advantage is that it uh, wouldn't take up as much space as far as, you know, moving this thing around. Sometimes that's a concern with large sculptures. Um, and I do really like the, the symbolic nature of it. Um, the downside that I see from this pose is that um, it loses some of the uh, majesty and the spectacle of this towering giant thing. Um, having him kind of down in this almost prone position really fights with uh, one of the one of the things I wanted to get across was which was that you know this thing is Colossus. Uh, so, well, I've got plenty plenty of footage from it thanks to uh, Mr. Head Camera. So I'll be able to refer back to this after I uh, try a different pose. So, okay, let's try something where he's standing on two legs. In the actual game, he doesn't do what a creature, a bipedal creature, would actually do if a thing was stabbing it in the top of the head, which is, you know, go and just crush him. Because, well, that would make the game uh, really short. So. So really putting the arm up like that is not not very accurate. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you're looking at a sculpture and you're seeing that there's some kind of narrative there, um, you, you might be wondering, what is, why is this creature standing here like an idiot while this guy's stabbing him in the head? So I definitely like the, the torsion that's caused. Um, by the, so the, the spine twists like that, his 
his pelvis is going off in one angle, his uh, sternum is going in a, def a different angle, and then you continue that movement with the, the head looking up like that. That's kind of a, um, kind of a dramatic thing. At this point, I don't really have a, a good idea. I'm literally just pushing stuff around and as it gets near to something that appeals to me I, I uh, start honing in on that. So let me save you $30,000 right now. This is what I learned from my education at the Art Institute of Seattle. Don't accept your first design. End of class. Uh, that's pretty much it. Is the very most important thing you can learn as an artist or designer is you're going to come up with your first idea, you're going to love your first idea, and you're going to do your first idea, and um, that and it's not going to be as good as your fifteenth idea. So get in the habit of uh, loving your first idea, and then moving on and then move on and move on and you may end up coming back to the first one but the uh the important thing is that you went through the process of experimenting and, and seeing if there's other um, better better things going on hmm speaking of better things going on i'm not not running into one quite yet i think that's got kind of a bestial majesty to it Bestial, beast, bestial. I don't, I don't know how to say that. Pro tip number seventeen, B, is do not say the word bestial unless you know how to pronounce it. Oh, but the British pronounce it bestial. Oh, so bestial, scandalous. <laughs> So here we essentially have um, a modified form of the first thing where his, his um, movements are starting to mimic um, water on his head, but um, he's not down on his knee, um, really struggling. On the other hand, it's not a super dynamic pose. It's like I was talked about at first with the uh, how to draw comics the Marvel way, um, it's always best to get a, a really good anticipation or follow through. And there's nothing, nothing really anticipating about this. This is clearly in the middle of movement. He's moving one arm in one direction and another arm in the other direction, but you really, you can't tell which direction it's moving. You don't, uh, you can't perceive the thought behind it. It's just kind of a pose. Whereas when you get the hand really up there, it's clear, you know, it tells a story. There's some thought behind that action. That's kind of dramatic in a stupid way. Let's see if I can find something dramatic in a non-stupid way. It's almost like he's shouting into the rain. No. Alright, so helmet cam just died. So um, and I think I'm at a point right now where um, it's time for artist tip number 21, and it's this. If you have the luxury to uh, sleep on a major decision. Uh, an artistic decision, do it. Um, right now I could keep fiddling with this and fiddling and then I'll come up with something and I'll say, okay, well that's that's good enough, we'll go with that. But since this maquette's going to be driving the next however many hours I'm going to be spending on this thing, um, it's probably not wise to kind of make a just a snap decision after I've 
spent, what have I spent here? An hour and a half. Um, and it's 2.30 in the morning. So at this point, probably better to come at it fresh. Um, see, I'll review the footage of the, uh, the last pose that I liked. Um, I'll play around with it some more and come up with a better decision then. So call it a night for now. And I'll be back in a snack.